Hello there and welcome to another edition of the Big Q. Today I have the pleasure of hosting the country manager for World Bank, Miss uh, Roland Price. Of course, she is very new to the country and we'll be talking about matters of economic. But before we dive into our questions, let us take through uh, who, you know, the new country manager for the World Bank is. Well, she is a Jamaican national. Miss Price joined the World Bank Group in 2006 as a counsel in the legal and vice presidency, representing the bank in operations in Latin America and Caribbean as well as Sub-Saharan Africa and the Pacific Islands and also providing legal advisory support in finance, infrastructure and private sector. She has since worked in three regions, which is the East Asia, Pacific, uh, South Asia and Africa and has been has or rather overseen the World Bank uh, group programs in the Caribbean, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Burundi, Uganda, Tanzania. It's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to see a woman at the very top, you know, being Thank the country so manager much. of Rwanda. Thank you so much. It mm. is indeed a pleasure to be here. Mm. And I think one of the things already that I love about Rwanda that it is not um, unique to be a woman at the top. Uh, yes, <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. It's almost three months down the line. How, how has it been experienced in the country? You know, it's fantastic. I actually started this role outside of Rwanda because mm. of the COVID-19. Mm. I didn't start in country. Oh. And immediately as I started engaging with the counterparts, all of the reputation of the country I found was true. The strong leadership, the shared vision, that very much, that very big drive for results. Mm. All of those things were evident as we talked about our programs and I saw sort of the distinct progress that was being made. Um, then when I landed in the country in late August, immediately I think a person is struck by the very unique um, topography, mm. you know, <laughs> the hills everywhere, the beautiful lights on the hills at mm. nighttime mm. and some of the most amazing sunsets that <laughs> I have seen ever. I've, I keep taking photographs and sending back to my friends. Mm. Um, but then also I think the thing that has really struck me is the, the sort of quiet and calm dignity of the people, the, the warmth, but it's kind of a very kind of humble warmth. Um, you know, I've interacted with my, my staff mainly, a couple of members of the government, and I've just really been struck by their openness, their, you know, their welcoming um, nature. And so... I know I've chosen the right job. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here. I'm sure we're glad to have you here as well. <laughs> so you arrived in the country at a very critical time, you know, where the COVID-19 pandemic has negatively impacted not only Rwanda, but, you know, across the globe. Is this something that you feel will, you know, hamper your mission to the country? Definitely not. I mean, mm. we're in development and we are about supporting the government on its priorities. Mm. COVID-19 is something that, as you've said, has had a global impact. Mm. And so everybody, the government has pivoted. And of course, the bank mm. who supports the government in its program also has had to pivot. And as we've thought about that, I mean, the World Bank helps a broad cross-section of institutions and governments. And we've had to think a little bit about developing a framework for how we're going to address this crisis as the crisis has sort of continued to develop and mm. has been prolonged. And there we have a sort of four-pronged approach. The first essentially focused on saving lives. It's the emergency health response right at the beginning. You know, we had to be out there supporting governments to strengthen health systems, ensure persons got treated and tested and, you know, set up ways to manage that. The second very much dealt with looking after the poorest and most vulnerable. And the, the instrument that we used there was a focus on the social protection systems, you know, systems that support poor people. But here, the coverage usually broadened and deepened in that the benefits that they would receive you know, were increased and the number of persons who were covered were also increased. Mm -hmm. And then the third prong really had to do with preserving jobs and livelihoods. And through that or with that, looking at ensuring that businesses survived this crisis. Um, the fourth element and the, the last element really looks forward to the economic recovery. 
And so there we are focused on policies, we're focused on institutions and investment, because we would like to try to ensure a resilient, an inclusive and a sustainable economic recovery for Rwanda and for the developing countries that we support worldwide. Mm, absolutely. You know, we're looking at COVID-19, of course, you've rightly mentioned that it has affected, you know, economies across the world and, you know, SMEs, entrepreneurs, <laughs> you know, it's such a big deal. But then how then are you trying to ensure that, you know, the government developmental projects are not stalled? Know that they keep moving, there's money being put in there, especially with the World Bank flagship uh, programs that are in today. Thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, many of us as, as, as citizens, we sort of sit back, we look at the government and we think, I'm sure that if we were given a chance, we could do it better, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but governance is really hard. Right? You have to know how to multitask. You have to be able to, as the Americans would say, be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so here, the focus has not just been on the response to the COVID-19 crisis, because there has been a significant response for that. The government has pivoted. But also, how do we look at those persistent development challenges that the government is confronting on a day-to-day -day basis? And I mean, we have many flagship programs. We have programs in energy, we have programs in stunting, et cetera. Yeah. But I think for me, the best example that I could bring to illustrate what the government is doing and what we're doing to help would be our education flagship program. Last year in about June, we approved a $200 million program to support quality basic education. And there we are looking at student retention, improving the quality of teachers and the built environment for students. Um, a couple of challenges that Rwanda faces, and you probably know them better than me, mm -hmm. is that some students have to walk a very far distance to get to school. And when they get to school, those classrooms are crowded. You know, teachers, if you have to manage 75 students, it's not the same as if you have a smaller number who has your attention. And some of those teachers, I mean, though they're doing their very, very best, they could be better capacitated in order to really bring good education outcomes. Unfortunately, at this time, Rwanda is facing very low education outcomes relative to some of its peers. And so with that $200 million program, we plan to change all that. We are supporting the government. The government actually came to us and said, look, we have to build 22,000 new classrooms. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a small number. Not, yes. <laughs> and they said, if you, World Bank, will help us to finance half of that number, we will find the resources for the rest. That's a great deal. It is a great deal. And yeah. so we joined in, jump, you know, jumped in for that and joined hands with the government to deliver on that program. Um, then COVID-19 hit. <laughs> and in other places, I can tell you, the response would be to retard the progress. Mm -hmm. Persons have to stop. They have to readjust. Um, but it really shows, I think, the agility of this government. The fact that they stopped, they thought about it and said, COVID-19 means that our students are out of school. It means there's going to be an even greater need for these classrooms when we get back to work. And it also is an opportunity for us to accelerate the building yeah. of schools. And so instead of phase one, we were doing 2,700 schools in the first year. They said, let's do phase one and phase two together. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and so really, the government is aiming for delivering approximately 11,000 schools mm -hmm. in less than a year. It is remarkable that mm -hmm. this program um, essentially has dispersed about 75% already of the resources. We were, of course, worried because when you're moving so fast, there are oftentimes lots of risks. But we have been partnering in a very close, you know, shoulder to shoulder with the Ministry of Education. I met the minister recently, incredible woman, um, not at all deterred, <laughs> you know, running straight ahead. Mm. And when I say it's a good example, as COVID hit, we were also able to... Um, bring additional resources that focus specifically on the COVID response in education. And so these additional resources, some almost $10 million, are looking mainly at remote learning. How are we going to assist the government? Because now students are out of school. We can't afford to retard their growth 
Absolutely. Yes? yes. How are we going to help the government to provide um, the right sort of system, the establishment of a learning radio channel? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, for That's those right. who are outside, not able to have access to maybe um, tablets or, or, or smartphones, but they can always turn on the radio if you're in a rural community and still get education mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the, the, the many things that that $10 million grant is helping. It's also looking at safe return of students for schools. Good. So making sure, for example, that there is hand washing stations and proper sanitation, yes, mm -hmm. so that people can keep safe and healthy. Mm. So you, it's an example exactly of one of our flagship programs that's looking at a longer term persistent challenge, but also has and has pivoted to take advantage of what generally is a bad thing. We see COVID-19, but we said, ah, students out of school, let's accelerate mm. the building of schools. Mm. The government said that. We mm. said, we're right there with you. Mm. And then also looking at the specific COVID response, added more resources, and looking at trying to respond to those issues that become more poignant because of the COVID-19 crisis. Absolutely. I wanted to tap into your experience of energy and infrastructure, yes. not necessarily in Rwanda. Of course, you have been across the world. You have seen the challenges that still persist year on, year out. You know, How do we change this notion to ensure that you know, Africa is also trying to get the right infrastructure, but also energy should not just be, you know, something people dream about. It is something that everyone can tap into, you know, watch TVs, listen to radio. How do we change this notion? Fiona, that is such a good question. And again, um, Rwanda leads, mm. yeah? The government has set a target for universal access to electricity by 2024. It means everybody should be able to turn the light on, mm -hmm. right? That light could be coming from, you know, the, the wall in your system because you're connected to the grid, mm. or it could be coming from a solar system or some other type of system. But the government wants to make sure that in 2024, by 2024, everybody can turn the lights on. The energy sector has been a sector that the bank has been engaged in for over a decade. And in 2009, um, I think the total coverage was something like 9%. So not very much. Um, now, 2019, that number has moved to over 50%. It puts Rwanda in the forefront in terms of the speed at which it is electrifying. And most recently, within the last two weeks, I don't remember the exact date, but we, had, we did another um, energy program, supporting the government's energy program on energy access, another $150 million. I think one of the things that is very unique about the energy sector is the manner in which the government has able to pull together a number of donors around this common objective. And the bank has helped to lay that platform so this program is looking to, you know, electrify, to deal with grid access, but also to support um, off-grid access. Absolutely. And there I think it's very important. It's one of a suite of instruments in our toolkit. Last week, Friday, I had the privilege of speaking at the launch of the fifth window of the Renewable Energy Fund. And the Renewable Energy Fund is another one of these bank-supported operations. There we were with SIDA, the Swedish um, Development Agency, uh, where essentially we are looking to motivate private sector to come in to help with some of the solar, the acquisition of solar systems for homes. So the government is, is, has a diverse plan, right? Maybe the grid can't get to everybody immediately. So for those in rural areas who might not have access to the grid, you want them to be able to access solar. And so that's a private sector solution. We, we called upon the private sector significantly during that launch saying, look, this is something that the government can't do without you, mm. right? Rwanda will not get there only by investment of the government in grid access. But we are facilitating through that fifth window um, private sector to come on board and also families that um, not, might necessarily not have the money to have a small subsidy mm. to be able to purchase these systems for their homes. So on energy, there's, a, there's an excellent plan, right? We have a number of instruments. In the original project that I was speaking of that looked at grid access, we also were looking at clean cooking. Yes. Because mm -hmm. there are, th that's another area where persons might have been using wood and that has a number of challenging um, health 
consequences. And so it's another target that the government has set that they would wish you know, for, for there to be more universal um, use of clean cooking methods. And that program essentially supports both aims. And it also brings together, as I mentioned, a number of different donors who are operating in specific aspects. So the government has set a target. It has said, we want all of you to line up and face in the same direction and support us in achieving it. And as a group of donors, we know that this is a laudable goal and we're behind that. Absolutely. Well, we do take a short break, but when we come back, of course, we we'll still talk to the country manager for one. Of course, she's the World Bank country manager, and she'll be telling us some of the other priorities and what the CPS launch is all about. Do keep it the big key. Arabia app is here. How to get it? It is easier than ever. Go on your home screen. Press Play Store or App Store. Type Arabia. Search. There you go. You have Arabia app. You have all Arabia radios, news, business news, sport and entertainment. Welcome back and thank you very much for keeping it the big key. Of course, I'm still talking to the World Bank country manager, Miss Roland Price. Before we went for a short break, of course, she was telling us how the World Bank is trying to help that the energy sector is not left behind, especially in terms of cooking, you know, a renewable energy and all, uh, all types of funds that they're trying to ensure that uh, the world, as the world progresses, Rwanda is also left, not left behind. Let's look in gender, you know, gender is one of the biggest <laughs> issues, uh, specifically for Rwanda, you know. You know, gender is listed as one of the cross-cutting themes among the World Bank uh, support priorities. What does this mean? I know, we use fancy language sometimes, <laughs> um, but really, it, to break it down, gender is something that runs throughout our program. It cuts across all of the various pillars that we are working in. And by putting gender as a cross-cutting theme, we're, we're making a commitment that in each and every one of our interventions, we're going to make, to try to ensure that women have an opportunity to participate, an opportunity to take advantage of what their male counterparts are able to take advantage, an opportunity to ensure that women are not left behind. I think in Rwanda, you know, you are very used to seeing women leaders. You have one of the highest number of women in parliament or highest percentage of women in parliament. And so, you know, looking at that, someone might say, we don't, have a, we don't really have a gender problem here. But that's not per se the truth. Um, there are still some areas where we could do more. And so what we're attempting to do is to ensure that in all of our interventions, be they interventions where we're doing analytical work, where we're doing research to identify the problems and solutions, we look at that also with a gender lens. You know, is this an area where women are not able to take full advantage? Why is that? And what can we do? What are they doing in other parts of the world that we might be able to bring here? Or what specific conditions are, hap are you know, at play in Rwanda, why for this particular segment of women, they're not able to participate. And how then will we translate what we've learned through our research mm. into our projects mm. to try to address the problem? Then how do you ensure that there's equality, you know, it comes to the World Bank <laughs> <laughs> projects? I'm sure it's not an easy task. No, it is not an easy task. And I, and I don't think that we can ensure equality, mm. but we can ensure greater participation and mm. taking advantage of opportunity. And I think one of the ways that we do that is, as I mentioned, with this analytical work, which is how the bank starts all of its work. We don't like to go in blind. blind. <laughs> yes, we want to know. We, we take very seriously the privilege that the government has offered to us to engage with them to help them solve their most important development challenges. And so we have to go in knowing something. And we bring to that the global experience. The, the thing that we bring is that we're the World Bank, and we cut across so many different sectors. 
And when we do that work, we attempt to determine what are the types of um, interventions that we might need. And when we translate that into our projects, we sort of embed it in the project design. But we also go one step further. We also embed it in our results framework. Right, so we try to set the target that we want to meet mm -hmm. associated with the intervention that we had designed. And then we monitor it. And there's nothing, I mean, particularly for a country like this that is so performance oriented, it's a beautiful thing to see. Because when you set a target, it forces everyone involved in that operation to focus on it. And so for most of the World Bank projects, every six months, we sit with the government and sort of you know, take stock of how, we're, how are we doing. We call that implementation support. And at that time, we also look at those targets. And so for example, on our skills project, we have a project called Priority Skills for Growth. One of the indicators that we have set is the number of students who have gone through the SDR program um, and who are able to find employment after nine months. So after nine months, we hope that 65% of all of the students who have gone through this program find employment. But we've also set a target for how many female students we want to have found so, employment, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And that's 35%. So when we go, we can say, oh yeah, we're doing really well, we're hitting you know, almost 65%. But the question doesn't stop there. They said, okay, well, how are, how are we doing in finding employment for women? And if that number is well behind, then there's a brainstorming, right? There are questions we're asking ourselves. Why is that the case? What can we do? How do we go out and try to motivate movement towards that target? And so it's, it's really, as I said, about designing interventions, but then monitoring to ensure that we are hitting those targets that we've set for ourselves. Mm, absolutely. I want us to talk about the CPF launch. You know, what is this all about? <laughs> <laughs> the CPF. How I know. About? It's <laughs> terrible um, because we use so many acronyms in development, right? <laughs> so the CPF stands for Country Partnership Framework. And essentially, it is a joint document that we prepare with the government. And when I say we here, I am going beyond the World Bank, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, or the International Development Association, which is the part of the World Bank group that focusing, focuses on interaction with governments. That's what I sort of am responsible for here in Rwanda. But we also have other parts of the World Bank group. And another part that your viewers would have heard about, more likely than not, is the International Finance Corporation. And that principally interfaces with the private sector. There is also MIGA, which is the guarantee agency. And that looks at political risk and other types of guarantees. And all of us work together mm -hmm. in the preparation with the government of the country partnership framework. And that framework essentially sets out what are the areas, what are the sectors in which we will engage, we the World Bank Group, with the government? And what sorts of objectives will we be trying to achieve together throughout the period of the CPF? And in this case, we're going up to 2026, June of 2026. So it's a six-year program. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, very much a strategic document. It sort of is high level and sets out you know, broad objectives. It also sets out specific programs, specific projects, specific analytical work that we can think of today that we would want to work on together. So would you call it a dynamic document? And is there room for adjustment? Because we have this pandemic today. Maybe when you're coming up with a framework, you know, the pandemic was not part of this discussion. And probably in the next six years, who knows what else, you know, the world or Rwanda will be facing. Is there room for adjustment for this? Fiona, this is an excellent question. Um, and the, the short answer is yes. It is, a, it is an extremely dynamic document, and that is standard because government's priorities change. Um, you know, there are economic shocks, there are natural hazards that occur that might not have been foreseen when mm. one started or when one developed the, mm. the, 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 the CPF. And so there has to be an opportunity to pivot, to move, to reprioritize, to change throughout the period. But I have to say about this particular CPF, and I can take absolutely no credit for it because I came after it already went to the board. So my predecessor, Yasser, is who worked on it with, a, with the huge country team. This CPF is very special. 
Um, the CPF focuses in the first instance, let me tell you a little bit about how we develop it. Please. <laughs> um, it focuses in the first instance on what are the government's priorities, right? That's our starting point. Mm -hmm. What is it that the government has set out as its development priorities? What would it like to do? What would it like to achieve? Mm -hmm. The second point for us would be, what are the bank's priorities? And there, we're looking at our priorities not in a vacuum, but for Rwanda. That document, the document that captures the bank's priorities, and we do one of these for every country, is called a systematic country diagnostic. And we look at the entire economy with a view to determining how can we eliminate extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity, boost the incomes of the bottom 40%. These are the twin goals of the bank. And so when we look at each economy, we're mm. asking ourselves that question. How do we unlock that? What, what are the levers that we should be pulling to address extreme poverty and the growth, the development, the upward mobility of the bottom 40%, the poor and vulnerable in society? And we essentially reflect those priorities in the systematic country diagnostic. And then we also want to work in, in the country on the things that we know how to do really well. So we think about what is the comparative advantage yes. of the bank. <laughs> we bring also lessons from the last CPF. You know, we mm -hmm. implemented things. We've been in Rwanda for a long time. What do we know works well and what do we know didn't work well? We want to make sure we don't make those mistakes again and we double down on the things that worked very well. And um, all of this is put together in order to, to, to come up with the CPF. In this instance... The CPF was worked on and sort of was almost at a ready point when COVID struck. Yes. And so we had to go back, the team had to go mm. back and take a look at it through the lens of the government's economic recovery plan, where the government has essentially set out its priorities mm. for helping to manage the COVID crisis and the resilient recovery thereafter. And then we streamlined and focused our interventions through that lens also. So it already has had the benefit of that look, but we can't tell the future. None of us are fortune tellers. <laughs> we have a sense of how things are gonna go, but it might not go that way. And so we are, of course, are very open to take the government's lead, to take the government's steer on whether priorities change, whether, what we need to double down on, what we might need to do less of. It depends on where they might also be able to raise resources from other donors. And so it might mean, you know, World Bank resources can be moved to, do, to move to another important sector because they're well covered on certain other sectors. So we are here, we are extremely flexible and we are here listening and attempting to respond to the government's most important priorities. But before I let you go, I want you to tell us, you know, the key priorities that are in this new uh, CPF. You know, we're launching the CPF next week. Yes. I don't want to give away all <laughs> of the good juice and gossip, but um, mm -hmm. I, will, I will say that it's, we cover five areas. Mm -hmm. um, human capital development, which is very much a priority for this it government, is, as you know. Um, the second is creating an en enabling environment for private sector development which is important. A lot of the growth that Rwanda has experienced, Rwanda um, was the second fastest growing country in 2019 with GDP growth at 9.4%, coming second to Ethiopia, right? A lot of that growth has been public sector driven. The government is paying to generate that growth. And the time is coming, particularly as resources are being used more and more for other things and fiscal space is getting smaller. We use the term fiscal space, we mean the extra money that the government has to spend on programs has become less. Um, we need the private sector to step in. Private sector has to play a bigger role. And so the second prong really relates to creating that space, that enabling environment for the private sector to play a bigger role. The second relates to a question that you have asked, infrastructure. So we are focusing on infrastructure and the digital economy. I don't need to say more about why digital is important. Mm -hmm. That very much has been a focus of the government, but even more so underscored with COVID-19 and social distancing. The fourth is, relates to a very important sector, agriculture. I'm sure you know, but the agriculture sector employs 70% of your population. And so if we're going to do things about improving the, 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 the stock, the lot of the poorest and most vulnerable, we have to be working in the agriculture sector. And lastly, 
The fifth pillar relates to urbanization. People are moving from rural areas to urban areas. And we see globally that this is one of the ways to continue to have accelerated growth and to, you know, one of the ways to better people's lives. But governments have to be ready for that. There have to be systems in place. There have to be places for people to live. There have to be basic services. There has to be transportation. And so we're helping the government manage that transition. I'm very, very, very proud of this country partnership framework because I believe that we're hitting on some of the key government priorities. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for making time to be with us, Rowan. Thank you very much for and having best me. Best of luck and welcome, <laughs> of course, <laughs> to Rwanda. Thank you. Of course, I've been talking to Ms. Roland Price. She is the World Bank Country Manager and of course she's touched on a bit of the priorities that will be on the CPF launch that of course will be launched next week. So do keep it the big queue. My name is Fiona Mbavazi.